So typically the DSR is up at 6 o'clock in the morning and then the DSR sets out to go and meet his prospects or customers. So they have to travel anything between 30 and 50 kilometers to get access to the community that are working with kerosene. So the DSR is spending a lot of his time trying to really reach these people in their homes, telling them about the benefits of the product, demonstrating the product by turning on the light in a house that has never seen light. That is hugely powerful. MCOPA's mission is to upgrade lives, and that's not just customers' lives, but also lives of all the people working with MCOPA. What we provide to the sales agents is formal engagement, moving from informal sector to a formal sector. We also provide them better economic opportunities for them to uplift their lives economically through the MCOPA sales program. And the third and most importantly is giving them a pathway to a much better career. DSRs becoming sales executives, sales executives becoming field sales managers, and then moving up the hierarchy to hopefully becoming the head of sales one day. All of them coming through the DSR network. So in 2016, we had 1,000 DSRs across the country, and we have steadily grown that base to over 2,000 DSRs right now in the program. We are also very happy to see a large number of women doing extremely well in our program. We're talking of about 50% of our sales force being women. And if you look at the top 100 performing DSRs, if you look at the females, they are actually having a higher productivity than the men. Prior to MCOPA, I was self-employed. After being uh, interviewed, I was taken to trainings. I was taught about the product very well. And then after there, I was still taught about the skills on how to approach customers, on how to all the through the sales pitch. Right now, I have, I can say I have my own well. I have, um, I've been invested in lands. I've purchased lands. I'm doing, I've purchased motorbikes. And still, I'm doing well. MCOPA has really upgraded my life. Welcome back, everyone. We'll hear more about MCOPA later on in the program. I must admit, when I heard uh, the narrator in the video say that the women DSRs are actually more productive than the men, I thought, duh, should, that should be the case, right? <laughs> Before the break, we talked about the challenges and difficulties of investing in developing countries. In this next part of the program, we'll turn our attention to focus more on the opportunities. How companies in the Northern portfolio have captured these opportunities. Before we do that, however, let's welcome to our let's welcome our second startup entrepreneur from the network, Young Sustainable Impact, young passionate investor in innovators who want to change the world. Mr. Lucas Kell, founder of Water Reporter. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lucas Kill. I'm environmental engineering from Brazil, and I'm part of Water Reporter. Currently, there are 700 million people suffering from water scarcity around the world. And in just six years, that's going to be two-thirds of the world's population. Me, Taha, and Mohammed are part of the youth that's going to face that future, and we want to change it. So that we have created Water Reporter, aiming to become the first platform for water-related problems and solutions. We want, to, we want to make fast the process of going to, from problems to solutions. We know that problems exist, we just don't know where they are. We know that solutions exist, and we know they are good. But how we do it? We are collecting data based on geolocation and community validation about water problems. We are distributing to the right stakeholders that are able to solve them together. And we are accelerating by suggesting the right partnerships and possible collaborations between them. We are three young guys from three different countries that are really passionate about solving this problem. We have been supported by some huge organizations such as Grundfos, Young Sustainable Impact, and Norwegian Church Aid. But there's something still missing. You, 
We need a community to be with us. We invite you all to enter our, our website and become part of this new community. In just a few years, we'll all be part of the problem. So why not become part of the solution right now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. We'll now turn to a gentleman who is a successful global entrepreneur, philanthropist, and seed investor. He's the founder and CEO of Meltwater, a media intelligence company. He ventured into Africa, and specifically Ghana, my home country, over 10 years ago with the Meltwater Entrepreneurial School of Technology, called MEST for short. We'll hear about his experiences, his views on the opportunities and risks now that he has experienced them firsthand. Please join me to welcome Mr. Jorn Liesigen. Jorn, it's good to see you again. Very good to see you. Would you like to go inside? Jorn, so you were born in Korea, raised in Norway, started off as an entrepreneur here, went to the US and built a very successful business, and then moved to Africa with MEST. Can I didn't you move. I still live in San Francisco. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> went to Africa. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm. Can you tell us a bit more? Why Africa? Why Ghana? What took you there? Yeah, so in many ways, Africa was a little random. I, I actually never been to Africa before we started the school. Okay, um, that makes it still more so, so <laughs> surprising. That, uh, I was passionate mm -hmm. about entrepreneurs. I want to build a school for software entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think about a place that would, it would make the most impact. Mm -hmm. So some people ask me, why didn't you do it in Korea? I was like, Korea, you're doing well. And then other people ask, why do you don't do it in Norway? Mm -hmm. Norway is the richest country in the world. And so I'm trying to think about the areas. So Latin America, Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. And then we chose Africa. I see. How do you go into a country that you've never been in <laughs> and set up a business? It's very easy. You buy an air ticket. <laughs> well. <laughs> So the I, I think you're uh, <laughs> underplaying the bravery it must have taken, um, but I think the risk did pay off, um, and of course there's a lot of impact. As you know, I visited MEST, I know Thank several you. of your alumni, mm -hmm. um, and I'm an admirer of the work that MEST is doing on the ground. I'd like you to just tell the audience in your own words a bit more about what you're doing there, okay. wh what you're trying to achieve, and where you are in that journey. Yeah, so MEST is a school for software entrepreneurs. Every year, we have more than 6,000 applicants across the African continent. And of those 6,000, we pick the top 60. Through aptitude tests, through very rigorous selection processes. And those 60, we fly to Ghana. We host them there as the hostel. Mm -hmm. They give them a, a computer. And for one year, we teach them how to code, mm -hmm. make uh, mobile applications, web applications. And we teach them the basic of business model and go-to-market strategies. And a, a big part of it is really to working in teams. There's monthly deliverables. And the final examination is an actual investment pitch. Mm. So I came from Ghana two weeks ago. So we have 13 pitches, of which we invested in 11 companies. That's and, and an that incredible hit rate. That's, that's an incredible hit rate. And I, I'm actually fascinated to hear your acceptance rate is probably lower than some of the best schools in the world, <laughs> right, at that rate. So I think that's saying something. Um, you have said that your vision is for Africa to become a software superpower. What do you <laughs> think it'll take to get there? Obviously, MES can't do this alone. Um, but now that you've been on the ground, building on the ground, how, how do you see that unfolding? How is it possible? Yeah. So, so people think I'm crazy when I say that Africa could and should be an, uh, a superpower, software superpower. Uh, the rationale for that is very simple. And that is that there's so much talent in Africa. Okay. There's abundance of talent. There's a population of more than a billion. Mm -hmm. It's going to grow to, was it two and a half billion in 2050? Yes. Mm -hmm. And software is a young person's uh, world. Mm -hmm. One statistic that burned itself into my mind was that the median age in Sub-Saharan Africa is 18 and a half years old. Wow. In Europe, it is 43. In the US, it's 37. And 18 and a half years old, that's the median age. Then you can also believe that the population will grow as fast as, as well. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the productive youth in the world, Africa will have 
one of the largest concentrations of productive youth. And if you can teach them how to code, coders is some of the most sought, af sought after uh, uh, employees in the world. Absolutely. And uh, to learn how to code, you need a computer for a few hundred bucks. And after that, it's entirely up to your own drive and conviction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why I think that if you transfer commercially valuable skills, that's mm -hmm. abundance of talent, but you need to transfer commercially valuable skills. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think <coughs> private companies or, or the private sector has a role to play. Private sector has uniquely valuable skills. And if you can pass that on to, to the talent in Africa and give them a friendly push in the right direction, they can take care of themselves. Very, very um, engaging vision that you have there. Now, taking a step back, I want to bring this back to some of what we were discussing before, uh, the discussion around perceived versus actual risks. You've actually gone there, <laughs> and you have <laughs> done this, uh, and you've been in, present in Africa in a meaningful way for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit to what your perceptions were of the risks before you went there? Mm. And what it is that you have actually found in practice now that you have done what you've done there? I think it's an important message. Yeah. Um, and it would be helpful to learn from your insights. So I think we went to Africa with the perspective of being long term. And I think also the luxury that we had was that we used our own money. We didn't, we are not depending on donors mm -hmm. and, and so on. But we came to Africa. Uh, primarily for a philanthropic perspective. We, of course, we didn't know and understand what we were getting ourselves into. Uh, first time I was in Nigeria, I made sure that I said proper goodbye to everyone <laughs> in my office. <laughs> I don't think you're alone, but I, I will not join the Nigeria <laughs> bashing. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so it's a fair point. So the perceived mm -hmm. risk was uh, quite big, and mostly because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. but. Coming to Ghana, coming to Africa, and seeing everything's on the ground, you know, I usually say, if, if I was in my 20s, I would move to Africa in a heartbeat. It's the continent with the biggest opportunity that, that is out there. Wow. And I, my business is in all over the world, uh, and including Africa. But I think in terms of opportunities, particularly for an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. the African continent is, is unrivaled, I think. Of course, there's lots of, lots of problems. Of course, there are lots of challenges. But that's why there's lots of opportunities. Mm -hmm. There's so many services that doesn't exist. There's so many uh, sectors and, and needs that are underserved. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I'm a techie, since I'm an, an, a nerd, I believe a lot in uh, tech-enabled services, tech-enabled companies, and, and software. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you take one step back and look at the biggest wealth creation uh, that's taking place today is in software. Mm -hmm. The biggest fortunes in the world today come from Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and so on. But that's in the Western world. It used to be natural resources, industries, and so on. If you look at the biggest uh, fortunes in Africa today, they're natural resources. They are industries. But obviously, the development will be exactly the same in Africa as in other parts of the world. So the biggest fortunes to be created in Africa comes from technology and software. And I think if you do the right thing today, making sure that African software companies and Africans taking their fair share of the value creation mm -hmm. that's going to take place in Africa, it's abundance of opportunities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, one of the things you touched on is, um, I, I think stereotypically you think of technology companies and don't think about the broad range of consumer services and products that they can power, including even some of the sectors that we invest in. Mm. Um, one thing that I'm reminded of, if you can touch a bit on maybe a couple of your portfolio of your companies mm -hmm. um, that you have funded uh, through MEST, yes. um, and how broad the range is of products and services that people go on to create solutions to address problems yeah. that I think that'd be great. Um, so a couple of cases. So there was is one company, Kudobus, they build software for online merchants. They have no clients in Africa. Most of their clients is in the US. So they have about 20,000 merchants, online merchants. And they develop a specific software that helps these merchants to promote and sell their, their products online. And the, the irony is that these guys never bought anything online themselves because they <laughs> didn't have credit cards. <laughs> mm. um, another example is... For mobile money then. Yeah, yep. exactly. Mm -hmm. 
Another uh, company is um, a real estate site. So I was very skeptical to invest in a real estate uh, company, partly because I felt it was more like a copycat thing from the Western world. Mm -hmm. And it was already well-established real estate site that was yeah. building in Ghana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But after a while, we decided to give uh, uh, the startup a little bit of money. And these local guys out competed Jumia, Rocket Internet people, and with, a, with much less resources, with much less money, mm -hmm. they completely out-executed all the other players. So they ended up, one of the competitors failed and threw in the towel, the other one came to Mikasa, as the company called, okay. and sold the pieces that was left of the company to uh, Mikasa. So today, okay. Mikasa is number one, number two, and number three in Ghana. <laughs> Well, I don't know if that's a good thing, but I <laughs> <laughs> What? Uh, w uh, maybe I won't. Go ahead. And mm -hmm. the third one is, so I'm actually, I actually grew up on a farm, so I should have been a little bit more open to agriculture. But I didn't mm. think of technology and agriculture mm. as mm. something that was compatible. But we concluded that, you know, based on some of the examples we've seen, is a massive opportunity mm -hmm. to combine technology and agriculture. And there's a company called Complete Farmer, and they, they, they crowdfund farms. So I just bought a farm for uh, a chili farm okay. for $15,000. Okay, from six technology to farming. Yeah, All so right. it was technology-able <laughs> farming with mm -hmm. sensors and monitoring mm -hmm. and so on. And within six months, they returned me $20,000. Nice. The, okay. the business model was so good, I didn't believe in it. So I had to put money in it to see, to see. if it actually worked. Okay. So, so personally, well, I put money into it. that's one way to do it. And... Uh, <laughs> That's a pretty good return. Yes, and absolutely. that is open to everyone to invest. Absolutely. Now, to just close off, mm -hmm. you you see in your school young Africans from all over the continent. At this point, your yeah. enrollment is not just from Ghana or West Africa. Mm -hmm. What do you think lies ahead? When you look ahead, where do you see exciting opportunities? Um, just for an audience that is perhaps less close, uh, at least yeah. some parts of the audience. So you know, my my expertise and scope is very limited. So I, I focus only on technology because that's where I come from. And there are, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of opportunities in lots of sectors. But the opportunities that I see is in technology and technology-enabled businesses. And going back to, I, I think that the big fortunes, the big fortunes on the African continent will be created from software. And I also think that when I, when I said Africa can be a, a software superpower, it's not only to build software companies for Africa, I mean, today, India is a talent pool for software developers. Mm -hmm. Africa, with the population development, is obviously also destined to be that if the investment is applied in the right way. Great. Thank you so much. I think for me, um, what I, I most enjoyed hearing you say, for, with your perspective from having been there, is to emphasize that there is talent there. There's talent there that may need nurturing, but a, a lot of the press and a lot of what you hear is about the lack of management capacity. It's true. In many pockets, it is true. Uh, but it's also good to hear this, to balance the narrative, as we've talked about. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Me again, I actually forgot. <laughs> At this point, uh, we've all become more informed about the need to invest in developing markets, and we've also delved into the risks, real and perceived, of doing so. Let's now turn to what's actually happening on the ground. You're in for a treat as we dive into the experiences of three distinct companies, all of them North Fund investees, to understand their business models, their challenges, and their successes. We'll hear from, in this order, first M. Copa, who you saw the video for. CEO Jesse Moore will join us on stage. Next, we'll hear from Advanced MFI Myanmar, a greenfield microfinance institution with a focus on rural financing in Myanmar. CEO Yana Karian will speak with us. And then last, we'll hear from Freight in Time, a company that provides efficient logistics solutions to a number of industries, including the agriculture and humanitarian sectors in East Africa. Stepping in for the CEO, Shamit Shah, who unfortunately couldn't join us at the last minute for family reasons, 
is Norfund's own Abubakar Lawana, who is our project manager for Freight and Time. Good afternoon. So uh, I, I live in Nairobi, as you may have heard, or at least you've seen a, a very nice video of some of our salespeople in Kenya. And here's the thing. Whenever uh, customarily, especially in rural Kenya, uh, one gets up and introduces themselves to an audience and they say, good afternoon to the audience, everybody in the audience says, good afternoon back. <laughs> okay, so we'll just, we're just going to start again. Because if you, if you come all the way here from Nairobi overnight, you know, you want the warm Norwegian welcome, yeah? So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, that was good. Very good. On a, often I have to get people to do it two or three times before they get anywhere close to the volume that you would get in, say, Kibwezi in rural Kenya. But you did quite well. So thank you for making me feel welcome. Uh, the second thing that happens, which I don't encourage, is usually when, you're, when I'm speaking to groups in rural Kenya, there's lots of questions in real time. So you can choose not to do that so I can get through my speech. Um, but uh, it's very good to be here. And I just mentioned Kibwezi. Uh, Kibwezi is a town sort of halfway between Nairobi and Mombasa. It's an agricultural town. Uh, if anybody's ever been to the Savo National Park, which is a famous uh, game reserve in Kenya, Kibwezi is just on the edge. And one of the most powerful experiences in my life uh, was in 2006 in Kibwezi. It was about June 2006. And I had been working for an NGO for five years. And that NGO had been helping farmers uh, with various trainings and inputs to try to help them uh, do better in business. But on this particular visit, I'd been there four or five times, uh, out of seemingly nowhere, all of these quite poor farmers had mobile phones. I swear I'd been there six months before, I didn't see a mobile phone, and all of a sudden everybody had a mobile phone, and I asked them a very scary question. I said, now that you have a mobile phone, does the NGO that's been helping you for five years, or your mobile phone, which of those matters more? <laughs> and there was 14 farmers, and I asked like this, 14 people, phones. They wanted the phones, and the phone was a more transformative product they felt in their life going forward than was the NGO. Now, I'm not trying to say that the NGO isn't great. It's a wonderful organization. Um, but it was a tipping point in my career. And I wasn't quite as brave as Jorn suggested uh, that you should move to Africa in your 20s. So I was, I was 29 when that happened. Uh, but a couple of years later, after doing an MBA and working a bit more in telecoms, I moved to Kenya nine years ago to start MCOPA. So I'll do a, a quick presentation of what we do. I was really helped by the video that you saw. And in that video, you met some of our most important uh, team members, which are our DSRs, now over 2,000 strong on a monthly basis. Uh, I should also say uh, that I'm here with uh, much gratitude to Norfund, not only for the invitation today, uh, but also for the investment uh, as one of our lenders in a historic facility, which I'll speak about a little bit in the end, but effectively as a lender, along with several other DFIs and Standard Bank, uh, helping finance the customers that we reach with uh, pay-as-you-go solar. Um, so uh, first slide just says that we are often seen and thought of as a solar company. Uh, it makes sense. If you've read the name on the card, you said MCOPA Solar. And so yes, MCOPA uh, does sell solar, uh, but it does so in a very interesting way. And we do it for much bigger reasons than solar alone. Um, this is the size of the company today. Uh, so we're a little more than nine years since we started piloting, but officially we're a seven-year-old business. Uh, there was a sort of year and a half when we incubated and piloted this concept with customers and built up a track record before we could approach the likes of Norfund and others to invest in a company. Uh, we're very proud of how large we've grown today. Uh, so we've now connected nearly 800,000. This uh, slide's a little bit out of date, but nearly 800,000 homes in East Africa use our products uh, every night. Uh, we've sold over a million products because many of our customers buy on a repeat basis. Uh, we have 900 full-time employees, plus this month we should have 2,500 selling DSRs. So I could say that over 3,000 people get a paycheck uh, from MCOPA every single month. Uh, there's the active sales agents, again, a little bit outdated. Uh, we have over 100 retail points of distribution. Uh, and late last year, we crossed an important commercial milestone, which was becoming EBITDA positive for the first time. 
uh, and we remain EBITDA positive with hopes of becoming profitable uh, in the very near future in the next few quarters if things go to plan. So I think the important point to know is we've started a business with real social impact, real environmental be benefits, but we also want scale, and scale means sustainability, uh, and that means profits. So all of that is coming through. Uh, this slide tries to summarize, I'll, I'll, I won't do it justice, uh, but when I said before we're more than a solar company, uh, we are effectively a company providing connected products to customers who then pay for them using mobile money on a pay-as-you-go basis, upon which we develop a lot of uh, data, including credit data for people who don't otherwise have credit, and then we can refinance them over and again. So depending on the audience, uh, MCOPA could be seen as an energy company, and I once have, or several times I've, I've spoken to energy conferences or to energy investors, especially the investors, if they say, Jesse, is MCOPA an energy company? I will say, Yes, we are an energy company, uh, but we also have investors who understand that it's more like a finance company. And are you a consumer finance company? Yes, we are. Ultimately, I think we may be, in the long run, a data company, um, but it's all about a journey to get there, building up uh, this company that uses the combination of those three strengths that you see behind you. Um, let me, though, try to break it down more into the sense of one household. Okay, so the Inyango family here uh, would be very typical of a customer household of MCOPA, and they would have an income of about $200 per month for the entire family, okay? And prior to MCOPA, uh, they would have most likely used kerosene, batteries, uh, candles, and other forms of off-grid energy substitutes, as I call them, to light and power their home, okay? And the main needs that we're trying to address with our entry-level systems, uh, solar systems, would be lighting. That's done by kerosene and candles batteries, which is used for radios, and phone charging costs. So if I have that mobile phone and I'm in Kibwezi, but I don't have power, what ends up happening is I go to a shop or a neighbor and I pay them 10 cents or 20 cents to get my phone charged every couple of days. And if you bundle that all together, the average uh, Kenyan household that lives off the grid that would earn about $200 a month would spend about 60 US cents daily on energy. Yeah? It sounds like a very small amount, but if you multiply it by the fact that there are five million homes that don't have energy, and that each of those homes would spend on average 60 cents a day, you get to a very big number, yeah? Which in Kenya is about $2 billion a year, US, being spent on off-grid energy. The financing opportunity is to displace that and provide people with solar systems that don't require the need for those costs anymore. And the only way people can afford that is through what we now call pay-as-you-go. So these same customers cannot come to MCOPA and say, I want a solar system, here's $200 in cash, because they don't have the income to be able to save $200. Our proposition was how to finance solar on an affordable basis and displace the 60 cents with something better. Some of the development impacts are listed here, but we'll get more to that in a future slide. So here's the business model, it is explained in a few uh, sort of green, what are these? columns, um, but a customer like the Onyango family, and uh, when I say customer, I'm interchanging the household with the people. Um, not only are the women better uh, salespeople, they're also better customers, for, for clarity. Uh, and I think it's because in the household, it's usually the mother that's caring for the needs of the children, and the children and lighting go hand in hand when it comes to education. So a lot of our sales pitch, what the DSRs say to prospective customers is, what matters most to you in your life? It's the success of my child. How does your child become successful? They need to study well at school and earn a way into university. How do they study well? We need good lighting. And kerosene, I can tell you, is not only expensive, but it's a terrible way to light, and you can barely even read by it, never mind the damages it brings to health uh, and the environment. And so for a mother to be able to afford clean, renewable energy is not so much because the environment will benefit, but it's because their child will benefit. And that, to me, sounds like a very good sales pitch. So uh, the customers will pay a deposit of about 30 US dollars. Uh, now that deposit may sound high, and it is. It's the bane of my existence, yeah? I wish we could make that deposit zero, because then I could sell millions of systems every year rather than hundreds of thousands. But that is the only mechanism we have to be able to tell if the customer is really serious. I call it the sell the goat money. And I can literally tell you stories. I was in Tanzania about two years ago. 
uh, and we met a prospective customer in rural Tanzania, and she said, I like what you have, but I don't have $30, and she had a goat in her yard, and a goat in East Africa is kind of like a mutual fund. You buy it, and then you wait a little while, and you sell it when you need cash. So she went and literally walked down the street, sold the goat, and came back and bought an MCOPA system. So I always think the $30 is the, will you sell the goat test? Do you really have skin in the game, or in this case, does the goat have skin in the game, <laughs> in order to show to us that you're, that you're serious, which is not unlike in the West the way we finance home mortgages, right? We know what happens when you give mortgages away with no deposit. That's a story from 2000 and whatever, nine. Uh, this is the same principle where people need to show skin in the game, and that's the gating item for us on growth, but it's also the reason why then people tend to repay well. Uh, all their payments come through mobile money, and this I'm going to have to gloss over very quickly, but uh, I hope you've heard of M-Pesa. Hands up, everybody. Okay, good. So you've all heard of M-Pesa. Uh, I had the privilege of working with M-Pesa. I get no credit. I was the MBA student who uh, hitched along for a ride, but my co-founder of MCOPA uh, started M-Pesa with a great group of people, and M-Pesa has revolutionized the Kenyan economy and is now, or similar schemes are revolutionizing other parts of the developing world where low-income people who don't have a bank account can send you 50 cents through their phone instantly. And a very cool fact about MCOPA, th uh, and sorry, that's the only way we've ever collected money, okay? So we could not exist without mobile money because I couldn't possibly go and collect small amounts of money from people every day distributed across 800,000 homes. A cool fact about MCOPA this year is we are projecting to collect 31 million individual payments across 2019. And 31 million is a nice number because there are 31 million seconds in the year. So we will get to hopefully $70 million of revenue, but the way we get there is 31 million micropayments from poor people deciding to buy our energy instead of buying kerosene. And at the end of the program, what is important to know is they can develop a credit history with us and we have a piece of collateral to lend against in the home. So when I say we've sold a million systems to about 800,000 homes, the delta of now about 400,000 is customers who bought something else. And that something else can be more power, or it can be uh, a school fee loan, or it can be a bag of fertilizer. It doesn't really matter. But we can provide the customers with something else in bulk that they can't pay for, and that we can have them finance again with their solar system as the collateral. If you went to the bank and you said, I want to buy a second home, you could mortgage your first home and use that cash to finance the second home, and that's the same principle of what we do every single day. The vision is a totally connected home, and this is happening. I can tell you today that we have live SIM connections in 800,000 homes in Africa. This is where the data starts to come in, okay? The connectivity, but we put that connectivity there not for the data initially. We put it there so we could remotely shut things off when people don't pay and turn it back on when they do pay. And 31 million times this year when people pay us, we will send a signal out to their solar panel to turn back on. Uh, the growth uh, of this business model is quite phenomenal, okay? Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying MCOPA alone, I'm saying the business model. And I think we deserve credit as a business for starting a model in an industry. Uh, there are dozens of competitors in our space. Uh, I wish sometimes there were a few less. Uh, but fundamentally, we've triggered a new revolution. And there are startup companies from Nigeria to Zambia, uh, also in Myanmar, uh, you name it, companies that are doing pay-as-you-go solar. Uh, the only thing I want to say is it's a hard business line. And maybe the only mistake that has been made so far in our industry is people having expectations of building a champion business of hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue too quickly. It is banking, and you must take concerted controls to make sure that the credit quality of what you bring onto your books is solid. Hence the $30 deposit, and you got to go sell the goat. The bane of our existence is also the key to our success. Uh, and this is just a map, or not a map, but a visualization of uh, the African continent and the populations that are off the electricity grid. Uh, effectively, you know, we could debate this, but the off-grid population overall in Africa is only going to continue to grow because the population growth that Jorn and others spoke of before will exceed the grid growth. I also want to be clear, I'm, I'm a big fan of the grid. We use it at our office, right? It was... It powered the airport I left last night. It powered the hospital where my children were born in Nairobi. The grid is great for cities, but it doesn't make sense economically to string the grid out to low-income households where the consumption needs and the energy needs are just not uh, met by grid energy. 
some quick uh, indications of our impact to end, and this is also a big reason why we get up in the morning, and I hope uh, why our friends at Norfund get up in the morning. It's not just about building great business, it's not just about using cool technology, uh, but in the end of the day, knowing that you're making the world a better place, and when the days are hard and long and you can go to bed thinking, well, at least for whatever I had to deal with today, we can, we can know that millions of people have gone to bed uh, with clean energy, they've gotten rid of kerosene. I won't repeat the numbers uh, that are here, uh, but you can see the impact stretches from uh, economic development uh, to the environment to education and health. Uh, and that's why we're so proud to be working for the company that we've started uh, and so thankful to Norfund for your uh, support and your invitation here today. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, wow, it works. All right. We can try it in Myanmar. Mingalaba. Perfect. OK. Good afternoon. So my name is Jana Kadian. I'm the CEO of Advanced Myanmar. And my life has, let's say, put me in this wonderful country two and a half years ago with a chance to start up a greenfield microfinance institution. In my former life, I have worked a lot in microfinance all over the world, and the situation was such that I was always coming in in crisis, trying to figure out what to do better, how to get this institution through the crisis. Last one was in Tajikistan. Um, and so, startups seemed manageable. <laughs> And I also started working with Advance, which is a um, microfinance holding or microfinance group, mainly operating in Africa, but with a big in, a subsidiary in um, Cambodia, and with a clear commitment to microfinance as a development tool, as something which will first and foremost, enable inclusive development. When we look at Myanmar today, the country opened up six years ago. We saw economic growth, GDP growth, five, six, seven percent. That means the country is coming up. Now, how do you make sure that all the people, or majority of people, do actually have a chance to be included in that development, are not excluded? And the idea and what we believe in is that the way to do it is to focus on building financial stability of our customers. Financial stability doesn't mean just having access to credit. Financial stability means how can I have, how can I receive solutions to my real life problems when I live in a village which will make me have a peace of mind so I can focus on the future, rather than being concerned on a daily basis, what happens if my, if my mother gets sick? How do I pay for that? What happens if my house burns down? So the idea which we're coming in is that so, uh, providing financial solutions for real life problems to small entrepreneurs and, uh, and farmers is on the core of inclusive economic development. Um, that's what our business model is built on. Um, where are we? Myanmar, an interesting country. Uh, it is the 24th biggest country in the world in terms of population, 60 million. It is mainly rural, 70% of the population lives in a rural area. And the access to formal financial services is still very, very limited. And that means majority of people are using money lenders, family, and de dealing with their financial needs through their families. And only 12% actually serve, uh, save in a sustainable way with their uh, regulated institution. 
But one interesting point about Myanmar is that 80% of the population actually own a smartphone. We're not talking mobile phone, smartphone. <laughs> so people's affinity to technology and their feeling about, yeah, I can deal with that. I'm not scared of this, of this new thing, is incredible. Um, that puts us in a position of potentially leapfrogging a lot of the developments uh, which microfinance went through in other countries to a new set of the way we can deliver financial services. Actually, you know, I would prefer to say, call it financial solutions because service is something which comes from a product perspective. What we need to look at is solutions. So where are we? After two years, starting up from a hotel room, uh, today we have over 40,000 customers. We have been able to open 13 branches all over in the northern part of Myanmar. 55% of our, population, our customers are in the rural areas. Those are village bank customers, those are farmers, uh, people who work in the villages. Uh, we have 81% female borrowers and over 300 staff. Over 50% are women. That's something, by the way, I'm very proud of. Not for the sake of you know, it's nice to have gender balance, but I think it makes a big difference in terms of how the decisions are taken on a daily basis in the field and uh, what dynamics you develop with your customers, but also in, within your team. Yeah, this is one of our clients, a, v a village, banking loan, village banking treasurer from Pien Luen. Those are dragon fruits in the background. I was really surprised to see how they grow. <laughs> All right. So. Let's look at a couple more customers. Which direction? Ah, there we go. Okay, Ma Dao Mar Martin is, an, is a customer from an onshore branch close to Mandalay. She started with a small group loan of around $300 and has been with us for a couple, uh, for, since the beginning now. And another customer, Uwe Nang Su, also from Oncho. This is an individual loan customer who received a loan from around $1,000 um, specifically to repair his, um, oh, to repair some machinery and pay for uh, some family emergency health issue with, her, with, her, with, her, with his mother. Now, he was able to repay that and he was able to use that money actually pr um, productively. Now, Starting up an institution in a developing country can be challenging. I think we just heard from our, from our colleague before. It's not always what you expect, or it's better to say, expect the unexpected. Um, but there are certain things which you go in with. And some of the things we heard was like, you don't get enough capacity on the ground. People are not there. Uh, specifically, if you want to do a, fi um, a financial s a service or provide financial solutions, it boils down to people because money is fungible. What you do provide is a, is a relationship between your staff and your customers. If you want your customers to be treated with care and respect, that's the way you treat your, your staff. Now, reality in Myanmar is that we're coming in and there are no, uh, no, um, no educated CROs. The market does not exist. So one of our first big focus was we need to create basically um, a structured education plan where we onboard people fresh from university and bring them through an uh, educational process which takes up to, three, up to three months. Now, one of the issues we dealt from the beginning, we heard from our, from our, from our uh, competitors was, people come, they start working, and they, they leave you because their parents say, well, you know, help me in my shop. What did we do? We decided actually to go and visit the parents. So all CROs, all new people who start with us, we visit them personally at their home in the villages with a letter, thank you letter signed by me, 
saying, thank you very much for bringing up such a great son and daughter. We are there to give him a career. We will take care for your son and daughter. Please support his career with us. That made a huge difference. Just understanding what are the things which drive people in the field. Um, another question was, how do we get, um, how do we ensure that people have the correct mindset in terms of long-term perspective? So we spend usually around four days simply on creating uh, and teaching and working through so-called high-performing culture. What is it what makes you tick in your life? What do you, what do you see yourself in three years? That creates, a certain, uh, that creates an affinity to the company, and we see today that's how we, we actually create the culture internally. Training and, on, and, and creating the different levels in the company is on the, in the core of that. So for example, to, be, to become a supervisor, you need to have trained other people. That's a precondition for you to be promoted. Those are parts of the things we do. Um, some other challenges we're dealing with today is the ambiguity of the political environment. Um, Myanmar five years ago, seven years ago at this point, was a military, military dictatorship. The structures, the bureaucratic structures which were built, were built not to be efficient, but exactly the opposite. To build, were built to actually be able to, you know, to extract rents for the actual decision makers. And today, while that part is falling away more and more, the corruption side, the, uh, a lot of the regulations has not evolved. So some of the deal issues we're dealing with and that actually requires a lot of flexibility on the side of the management and also on the support from our shareholders, understanding what the challenges are, is working around those challenges and sometimes being patient. For example, we had a situation where we couldn't, we were unable to blow for three months simply because a certain approval wouldn't come through. We had our investors lined up, the loans were ready, but we couldn't grow. So those, those issues, you have to be flexible and you have to be ready to take them on and uh, make the best out of it, frankly. Um, another important part is committing to a long-term vision. Um, as I said before, I don't think, we don't believe that financial inclusion is simply pushing out loans. And we see how it works today in the world. We saw enough examples in the world today where pushing out loans has actually backfired, has not created financial inclusion. We see financial inclusion actually from perspective, where do we want to be? What do we want to provide to our customers? How do we can improve their life? And we see that more from a combination of loans, deposits, insurances. While, you, while to be able to be profitable in this actually very you know, small scale amount business, we, uh, we, we need to use technological advances to, act, to actually get our operating costs down and work that out. And the vision is important because this vision for us is important because that creates like a lighthouse for any ongoing decision making. Um, finding like-minded investors. Issues we see today in the market is that a lot of investors coming in into microfinance, particularly in Myanmar, that's the new emerging market. Um, it was a clear focus, push out portfolio, Grow, uh, grow portfolio, and then we'll, we'll see what's going to happen tomorrow. I think this is a very dangerous approach, and I'm, I think we're very, we're very glad and very happy that North Fund and our current investors have a very different view on that. Um, those are the challenges we're dealing with as a new institution. Now, where are we going? Tomorrow we will provide financial solution and advice to our clients wherever and whenever. One of our branch managers, he started as a loan officer two years ago and is today one of the future, one of the future leaders of the organization. Um, again, financial solution is what will bring inclusion. On a very practical level, that means that the idea we have in mind, if our CRO, our financial advisor goes into a village, talks to a customer, 
understands what are the situations customers dealing with and uses the products, not in the idea of selling the product, but the idea as a tools in a combination providing a solution of that specific customer. For example, you have a son who's going to go to university in three years. How do you, what kind of savings plan do you need to start today so in three years you have enough saved for, the, for your son to go to university? Maybe we can cross-fund part of that one when he actually goes to university. Or in the village next to you, next to you there was a fire just two, uh, two weeks ago. You have a bamboo, bamboo house built as well. How about you pay with, with $20, a, um, twenty dollars a month, uh, sorry, a year, uh, uh, a fire insurance? Those are re a solution to real problems. Now we are very new. We're still only two, two and a half years old. What we currently have is a, our deposit. Uh, we have a credit license. We don't have a deposit taking license yet. We're working on that. But I think uh, what we're looking to do is get to a level where we provide financial solutions on a bigger scale for, for each individual customer to, to, to help people be included in that economic growth, not to fall by the side. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's another one from Kenya. Yeah, so as Nana mentioned, I'm stepping in for the CEO of uh, Freight in Time. And just to give a brief on Freight in Time, uh, or FIT as we call it, it's a freight and logistic company which is based uh, in Eastern Africa. And Northern invested in this company in 2016. The whole idea of establishing this company by the family was because they had um, a company, a sister company, which is involved in, in agriculture, that is in production and export of vegetables out of Kenya and uh, Tanzania. But in that process, they've ran into a challenge that dealing with vegetables, which are uh, perishable crops, uh, if you don't get them to the market quickly, or you don't get them from the farms to the to their packhouse quickly, then you'll report losses. So the challenge was on logistics, and that's how freight in time uh, came into being. That it was to then uh, help this company, sister company, to sort out their logistical challenges. And over time, this company has grown uh, from you know. Being, having, ha, being present only in Kenya to about eight countries in, in the East Africa region. And as you can see uh, on that map, if you have a presence in eight countries, uh, you can sort of, and also have uh, agents in the other countries, in say you can then connect Africa you can connect uh, companies to even the landlocked countries in Africa. And that's why we say Freight in Time then became the gateway to East and Central Africa. Uh, in terms of uh, employment, uh, this company has 380 direct employees. Of course, because of the many companies that they have supported, the number of people employed are many. But in the process of meeting their own needs, they noted there was a huge gap in the market because other companies were also facing uh, logistical challenges. And that's why then they started supporting many other companies, which I'll give some examples on. When you talk about logistic challenges in, in Africa, in the past, I think what you see on the screen, uh, you know, poor railway network, poor means of transport, Poor planning of even when you have <laughs> tarmac roads, impassable roads, and also lack of airports. That's what quickly comes into mind. And it was interesting when, uh, when the panel uh, who was here before discussed about some of the challenges that uh, you think are there in 
Africa, some of you mentioned about logistics. But that is, that is not um, the case anymore. We are seeing now in some of these uh, African countries, you know, bigger cities coming up. Uh, Well-developed airports, uh, Freight in Time was actually involved in uh, supporting um, uh, the setup of Rwanda Airport by providing the logistic solutions. But also we are seeing the other bigger cities, you know, you need uh, customized logistic solutions for these cities to develop. Of course, that's the vision today. We are not there yet, but at least the, the something has already been started. Over time, freight in time have noted that there are some key sectors which are very important for development and which they should sort of give support to. And Norfan also have picked on some of these sectors as the key investment areas. So just to check on some of the uh, projects that freight in time have supported and the rationale behind this, I'll give you a few examples. One of it uh, is that Freight in Time was very instrumental in, in supporting um, Skatec Solar in setting up 8.5 megawatts solar project in Rwanda. In Rwanda, there is scarcity of power. And when Skatec Solar got this opportunity to set up this plant, one challenge that they experienced was how then to move these solar panels from different countries or you know, the switching gear, the control panels to, all, to, to such a landlocked country in the region. So Freight in Time provided the end-to-end -end logistics from all these countries, Germany, Italy, China, for all the equipment which was required. And also from Mombasa to move these fragile solar panels all the way to, to, to Kigali. And then from Kigali again, another 80 kilometers to the project site. This has been a success because that enabled the project to be completed in three months. And within no time, 10% additional power was injected into the national grid. As you can see in the photo there, there is a, a 30 acre solar farm in place. Uh, another uh, key sector which freight in time has really been of help is in the agriculture sector. As you know, agriculture is one of the largest employer and the source, main source of foreign exchange ANA in these countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and also most of the African countries. But within that space, the horticulture sector has become a big success story. The challenge with uh, horticulture is that you are dealing here with perishable crops that have to be moved uh, from the farms to the parkhouse and to the various destinations or even to the supermarkets, say here in Norway, within 24 to 36 hours or else you will report huge post-harvest losses. So freight in time has been very much instrumental there because of having cold chain uh, facilities having presence at the airports with customized um, uh, uh, facilities to move these very delicate and perishable crops to the markets. And that way, not only helping their sister company Sunripe and Serengeti Fresh in Tanzania, but also many, many other companies. Uh, lastly, um, Another key sector that the company is very much involved in is in the humanitarian and health logistics. Uh, as you all know, that the health of a nation is the future of a nation. Uh, without having their medicines or the vaccines reaching where they're needed most in the right time, then you will not have saved lives. So in a country like Uganda, where the government has secured uh, a number of, uh, you know, have secured huge uh, uh, volumes of medicines and vaccines from different partners, that is from the likes of uh, Gavi, which is the Global Vaccine Alliance, uh, USAID, 
or even the Global Fund, how to make uh, the vaccines, these vital vaccines, mainly for immunization, to reach to where they are needed most, which are the, in the clinics which are in far-flung areas, that has been a challenge. And so the government and Gavi had to sort of seek uh, an alliance on how to work with Freight in Time to do this happen. And Freight in Time is the one which provided that solution. Because these vaccines have to be transported uh, in, in very in, um, cold chain. Uh, you know, you have to provide the right transport uh, vehicles. And also, you have to uh, transport in very low uh, temperatures of about two to eight degrees. But just to give you a better snapshot of how that is happening, please see this short video. Tucked beautifully in the eastern side of the African continent is Uganda, a country that commands an enormous amount of beauty, economic growth, and stability. However, limited resources coupled with limited logistics interventions have made the delivery of life-saving vaccines to remote villages tenuous, leaving Uganda's next generation exposed to several serious and even deadly diseases. This is why Freight in Time Limited, UPS, its international global partner, in conjunction with the national medical stores, with the support and stewardship of Gavi, created a new solution that would bring these life-saving vaccines to the children that need them under a pilot project called the Vaccine Last Mile Distribution. This would initially cover the three districts of Nakasongola, Nakaseke, and Wakiso. Freight in time ensures reliable distribution and availability of vaccines in the facilities through equitable allocation of vaccines, timely delivery and supporting facilities in proper record keeping and accountability on a monthly basis. To attain a cost-effective distribution, Freight in time mapped out efficient delivery routes and created a mobile app that allows for ordering and stock taking at the health facilities. A remote temperature device has also been introduced to all delivery vehicles and fridges. As a result of improved availability of vaccines, coverage has increased, for example, polio coverage by 40%, measles vaccination coverage increased by 50%, and 40% more infants receive all essential vaccines by their first birthday. The success of this Gavi pilot is a testament that a well-managed public-private partnership can work and bring about value. Our solution is now open to multiple commodities that required cold chain transportation and potentially to all the other districts in the country. Freight in time is not just about logistics, but we are saving lives every day. Yeah, so as you have seen from there, the pilot is on three districts uh, out of the 135 districts in Uganda. The plan is to roll out the same last mile solution to other countries and also not only the vaccines, but also other vital medicines and other products. As you can see there then, without logistics, you can't do much, however much uh, you are interested in investing in these countries. So freight in time, is the right partner to provide this solution. So with local ex expertise, regional coverage, global reach, and with all these customized solutions, we think that FIT and Nofan are helping to build that backbone in, Af in, in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, Jana, and Abu, for those incredible examples on what, of what can be achieved on the ground. Because when we are concerned with and talking about moving money, we're not talking about moving money for the sake of it. We're talking about the types of results that can be created on the ground and for the people that you've heard about in these three examples. 
I'd like to turn it back to you. Uh, pick up your phones again, dear audience. Go to menti.com and think about the opportunities. What do you think the opportunities are when investing in developing countries? It's about impact, it's about growth, and it's about development. Many of you are also seeing opportunities for returns, creating returns while delivering on impact and development. And for Norfund, this is a prerequisite, because if we're going to help create jobs and improve lives, we need to have companies that are healthy and profitable that can actually deliver on that ambition. Now, what can we expect going forward? How can we mobilize more capital to where the capital is needed to capture the opportunities that you're describing here in terms of impact and development? We have a plan for Norfund's role. And to get there, we'll be relying on our partners, our investees, and of course, the entire Norfund team. And that, of course, includes our new board chair, Ola, welcome to the team. We're excited that you have joined us. Can you tell us about your motivation for joining the Norfund team? I do that, but first I bring uh, um, from Kenya what to do there. Good afternoon. <laughs> I think we should have that in Norway as well. We yes, <laughs> I think we have it's a new tradition. That, yeah, new tradition. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I would like to say that uh, uh, it's a great privilege to be the new chair of uh, Nordfam. And uh, Lisa Clement been there for 12 years, so it's a great privilege to take over the role after her. And I'd also say, after being here today, yeah, I'm very proud to be um, the chair, new chair of uh, Nordfam. And my main motivation is, you know, what we learned about today, you know, creating jobs, improving lives, through investing in companies that contribute to sustainable development, that is very important to me. And I have a background from the financial sector for 35 years, investments, and I'm, you know, I think it's very meaningful for me to use my competences and experiences to create uh, value. Mm -hmm. um, but I would also say that um, an important factor is that um, the Norfund team, I think it's great to be a part of the Norfund team. Um, Telef and the team, uh, they have, you have great reputation, is very well respected. And that is very important for us to deliver on, of, um, on the mandate. Because Norfund has a great responsibility. Mm. And um, one part is that we have the financial capital. We heard about today, the minister said that 1.9 billion more capital is, um, is coming to the fund this year. That's a huge amount of, of money. But we need to create value on, on this uh, capital. And, um, and then that is a great um, achievement to do that because like we've heard today, you have to find the right companies you have to invest in. You do that, have to do that in, you know, find the companies 
um, that need it the most, where we have the most development effects. We heard here today that we do need to find the good partners who do we do it with, you know, so that we can get more capital um, invested. Um, and, and thirdly, um, we need to be very active and responsible owners. And all this is quite a, a challenge, but we do see that Norfund has a good track record. And um, so that is very impressive, really, what uh, Norfund has, um, has uh, achieved uh, over the years. But if we have to be clear, it is a demanding mandate. We have to be realistic. Um, so that um, uh, going forward, we have to make clear that this is a challenge, but I'm really motivated to be part of this team in order to deliver on, on the mandate. And what are your expectations and, and hopes uh, going forward, your aspirations for Norfund? I know it's early days, but some reflections. Well, you know, it's so inspiring to be, uh, be here today, I must say. And uh, in a short while, you will hear the new strategy of, um, of Norfund. And it's a good thing. It's been a very thorough process. And uh, what you will see is that it's a very ambitious uh, strategy, very ambitious, mm -hmm. but that it should be ambitious. We should be ambitious because we do have a mandate where we should take on, on risk and we do want to make impact. So that is uh, part of the strategy. We should uh, have the bar very high. If you look at the scale of the challenges and also the opportunities, we have to be ambitious, right? Absolutely. So we are ambitious, uh, quite clear. But again, we do need to deliver um, on the development goals. We do need to have financial um, returns. Mm. But I would also say that one important factor is that, you know, we also have to be aware of that we do need to operate in a very responsible way, in a very professional way. We are dependent on trust. If we don't have the trust, we will not be, uh, be able to deliver on our mandate. So we do need the trust for our, from our owner. We do need the trust from the companies that we invest in, from the civil society, and I would say the society at large. So that is, um, that is um, very, very important. So the importance of trust and also your expectations, Ola, that we continue to build that trust, but also show that we are worthy of the trust that we have today. We're really looking forward to having you as part of the team and we'll do our best to live up to your expectations. And I look very much forward to, you know, um, you know so many exciting uh, uh, stories here today about the companies are doing so well, creating jobs, mm -hmm. and I'm very excited to you know, be out in the field and visit these successful companies that create uh, jobs and make an uh, you know, um, impact on, on uh, the personal lives for so many people. So, um, You've had a snapshot, and there is much to yes. look forward to. Thank you, Ulo. Thank you. <laughs> now it's time for us to turn back to Norfund CEO, Telef who will introduce Norfund's new strategy. Well, first, um, I must say I'm proud to have Oleg Svava as our new chairwoman. Um, we're really looking forward to be cooperating with you. And I'd also like to, and I will take the opportunity to just to thank you very much to Kristin Clement, who served as our chairwoman for 12 years. She's really been very valuable to Norfund, contributed a lot and we hope we can still make use of her. So thank you very much, Kristin. Um, when I signed on and when I started um, as a new CEO last autumn, I was also asked by the board to uh, help at chairing um, and help um, establishing a sort of framework for a new strategy for the period going ahead. And um, that was because the old strategy period had come to an end. Uh, and I was new, and for me it was also important in terms of getting to know the organization, making sure that I had an alignment with the board and with my owners to sort of get some pillars in place. Um, I'm not a believer in sort of five-year strategy periods, a Soviet startup of strategy, because we're living in a very dynamic world. I mean, look at what's happening in an energy field with the solar revolution. It's transforming all those that have established truths about energy. Look at what's happening in financial sector with fintech. It's really, you know, fast undermining the pillars of, for the banks, right? So, they, so we have to keep on adjusting, but we still need to set a direction. We need to um, have some clear views as to where we will be moving. 
But we also always have to keep in mind that it cannot be set in stone. Uh, we might adjust, or we will be adjusting, and going forward when we're meeting here again, you will probably hear me saying that, well, the, that didn't quite work out, so we're doing this instead. Uh, but I don't see that as a defeat. It's more natural. That's the only thing to do when you're living in, in, in a market changing so fast. Um, in terms of um, what we heard, heard today is that, I mean, that, that one thing is the economic aspect of what we're doing, but the way I view it, the way many people view it, is that the sort of the several elements that needs to be in place for a society to build a sustainable development. I mean, we need uh, institutions. Uh, we need someone that makes sure that there's law and order somehow. Uh, uh, we, may, we need some governance, preferably good governance, but at least some sort of a governance. And we need social development in terms of education, in terms of a health system, in terms of some security levels. And, of course, we also need, as we've been hearing today, sustainable economic growth. Uh, but, but our mandate is to uh, focus on the economic growth part of this equation. That, and the mandate was, was, was resolved by the Parliament and written into law in 1997. And, and as such, our, our task and what we've been asked to do is to assist in developing sustainable business and industries in developing countries. That's what we're asked to do. And as such, we get 5% of the annual contribution that Norway gives to the developing world uh, um, annually from the parliament. Um, and, but the other elements of this equation are obviously very, very important too. We're not asked by the government to assist Norwegian companies to export more or to help them establishing abroad. But we like, and we don't mind, of course, working with Norwegian businesses when, when we share uh, values and we share goals. And we also obviously work with local industries and other international firms. Um, we've been hearing today that the need for development is tremendous. Uh, I mean, we, we know that there's uh, far too many people without jobs and we've been hearing about how little funding and capital is going into our markets. That just underlines the, the, the fact that the need for uh, government funding, the way we are providing it, and us and the other so-called DFI, Development Finance Institutions, as we're being called, that our role is still important. Ideally, we, they wouldn't need us, right? The market would be serving all this by itself, and the private sector would deal with all the investment needs. But unfortunately, in many ways, we still need it, and we play, in my clear opinion, a very important role. And before I dive into the future, just a snapshot on where we are. Uh, Norfolk is scaled to make a difference. Uh, we have assets after February this year of about 30 billion NOx, uh, which are, you know, big um, assets in terms of cash and not least in terms of the investments we're having. Uh, and we will this year be committing, i.e. signing up contractual agreements for new investments of about 5 billion is what we expect. So we're receiving about two from the government and then we have returns and exits and repayments on the rest of our portfolio whereby we more than double our investment capacity in, in what we're doing. So exiting and getting out of investments is also important to get more money into new projects. And we're into more than 900 companies directly and indirectly and about 150 companies directly. So that's where we are. And you can also see that about 50% of what we do goes into clean energy. Um, and based on that, sort of how do we move this forward? If the government keeps on, which we hope, uh, continue to support us, the, the balance and our funds will keep on increasing. And as such, we have to also look into new areas and look how can we scale, how can we lift this going forward. And our mission, we talked about job creation, we see our mission uh, to create jobs and improve lives by investing in businesses that drive sustainable development. And this is also tied up to the Sustainable Development Goal 8. And as such, that's the key job that we've been asked to do, and that's what we're driving for. Um, and in that, I mean, it's also important that we can do something more than, than purely investing. Well, when we invest, we will also seek to be additional and catalytic. And what we mean by that is that we're, we're additional when we invest in, in markets where there's a capital constraint. Take freight in time as an example that was just presented by Abu. Um, they operate in, 
in Zimbabwe, in, in, in Burundi, in DRC, i.e. Congo. I mean, capital is very hard to raise for companies there. It's tough. And as such, we are financially additional to simply by investing in companies being in those countries. Uh, we are also value additional in the sense that we add value through our active board uh, work in the company by, by participating in strategy work, in practical assistance to the company, that's being value additional. We cannot be value additional with all our companies because we have to rely on others to do it for us because if we were to relate to all our 900 companies, it didn't work out, it wouldn't work out. And we also try to be catalytic and in terms of paving the way for new investors. Freight in Time is in the process of raising new funding these days and new other private investors will probably come in they want us to co-invest to show the support, the continued support, and as such, it's important that we're there. Uh, but if we can bring in other private investors and as such, pave the way, reduce the risk and bring in others, that's the way we see ourselves and our role as being catalytic. Um, we can also be catalytic on a more sort of overriding level in terms of uh, KLP, uh, as was talked about today, they've been co-investing with us in energy projects um, and in banks in Africa. Uh, we have Scotic Solar, where we've been co-investing with, uh, and sometimes they're leading the way, other times we've been leading the way in terms of opening up and challenging markets. And as such, that's a way of, of being catalytic. Based on this backdrop, well, so where are we heading? And, and the four key areas that we will be focusing in, in in this period, as we see today, we will continue to focus on clean energy. It's key to us. It will also be being asked by the government uh, to uh, provide a substantial part of our funding into that and that will continue to be a very important area for us and I'll come back to more details in terms of how we will do that. Um, we will continue to invest in financial institutions, that being microfinance, other types of it. Uh, we aim to build up a new area within what we call green infrastructure and we'll be investing in scalable enterprises. And as you can see, we also tie this up to the sustainable development goals. In terms of uh, clean energy, um, the way we view it is that, I mean, um, being able to provide clean energies and, and, and reducing CO2 emissions is a prerequisite for sustainable development. So and as such, it's obviously incredibly important. And unless we meet the climate goals, we run into bigger problems. So for us, we see this as going hand in hand in the sense that we work uh, providing clean energy is important for development, it's, it's important for providing jobs, but it's also important for reducing the, the building of more coal-fired power plants or uh, diesel generators as such. It's, we, we, we're working in, in sort of two areas in tandem. Uh, we will continue to do a, a more conventional type of power plants within hydro, um, and large-scale uh, photovoltaic plants and, and, and uh, uh, wind turbines, like the one you saw in the movie here. Uh, that will continue to be important, but we will be increasing our activity level and what we do on the off-grid side. Off-grid meaning uh, the type of MCOPAS and other type of companies that are not connecting to the grid, i.e. to the network. Uh, we believe that large parts of developing countries in the future will leapfrog in the way that you've seen with mobiles. Uh, we, in Norway, had to build lines everywhere uh, to connect our phones in the old days, uh, but we've seen in the developing world how people have moved straight onto mobiles. We think within the provisioning of electricity in, in more remote regions, the same development will happen. Uh, prices of batteries are coming down by about 19 to 20 percent year on year. The prices of PV, uh, the, the solar is coming down incredibly fast and much faster than I never expected. And as such, we, we have to be there. And if we also can lead the way, if we can help companies propel, that's part of our mission and what we should be doing. Um, we, our ambition is to, we're now uh, producing about 4,100 megawatts. I say we, meaning the companies and the power generation plants that we are part of which equates to about 10%, the same as about 10% of the total Norwegian production, which in turn is about the same as the same total combined capacity of Tanzania, uh, Kenya, and, and Uganda. 
Um, and, but the number of people we reach is obviously a lot higher because the average consumption per capita is much, much lower. So for this strategy period, we aim to more than double what we're producing now, or what our power plants are producing, i.e. increase with 5,000 megawatt. And we also aim to bring it on to more than 1.5 million households. The number of households we think will increase because we'll do more off-grid, uh, but we'll continue also to do the conventional part. You need large-scale power in cities, you need large-scale power for large factories, etc. So that's the main part of what we'll do in terms of uh, green energy. Uh, it's also should be said that the markets have been challenging lately because the, the fact that solar uh, power has become so cheap lately, the prices are dropping so fast, meet, means that we sometimes meet the pricing of solar, that uh, being sort of four or five uh, dollar cent per kilowatt hour. And people are asking for that when we're also building hydro or providing other sources of energy. But sun only sh still shines at daytime in most countries. So you need to do more than just providing PV. Um, then moving on to the financial institutions, we will continue to invest in this area. Uh, we will continue to do uh, both microfinance and larger banks. We provide loans as well as equity. And we're active owners of a large number of banks in Africa, for instance, we'll continue to do that. We believe that having essential financial infrastructure, being able to pay electronically, having a bank account, being able to borrow money is key to development. So, so for us, that's still a very, very important area. And, um, and we will, in terms of what we're doing now, we will, we now, um, ambition is to offer financial services to about 15 million new clients and which will increase from about 25 million clients that we're serving today. And uh, we also will also be more than doubling, we believe in this period, uh, the total loans paid out by the institutions that we're part of, which is a, uh, a steep ambition for us. Um, then uh, moving on to scalable enterprises. Um, that's the third key focus area for us. And what we mean by that is that we need companies, particularly in Africa, and this, and this part of what we're doing will primarily focus on Africa, um, needs large scale employers. You need large companies that can really provide volume type of employment. So we will do that partly by focusing on agribusinesses and preferably businesses that are not just doing primary agriculture, but also do a larger part of the value chain packaging, storing, uh, uh, and preferably bringing it all the way to the consumer. And we will also do select investments in other type of manufacturing. That will be very much partner driven. So we'll be needing industrial partners that we can work with and that share our values. So we cannot now tell you exactly what those verticals are going to be because it's very much dependent upon whom we can team up with and who we can build and be part of investing into manufacturing plants together with. Um, and um, so ambition is that we will, you know, create a large number of jobs in this sector, 50,000 we've stated, uh, but that number is still a bit fluffy because it depends on who we team up with and how we exactly structure that area. Then when it comes to green infrastructure, that's a totally new area for us. Uh, what we're after is that we've set up a project team um, and we are still in a very sort of investigative uh, research phase. What we're aiming to do is to be part of providing key infrastructures to cities and communities, and particularly as regards waste management um, and maybe water, um, and if possible, some transmission. Waste management is, is an area where many of you have been traveling in Africa or in developing countries where you see that there's waste basically everywhere. Waste is also value. I mean, in terms of plastics or metals or glass or paper, if it can be collected and if it can be uh, uh, used as fuel for, for energy or if it can be recycled and sold off. Um, so we are now talking to some potential industrial partners and seeing if we can do something within um, the waste sector. And um, uh, it's, it's a difficult sector because even in Europe, I mean, there are dodgy players and, and it's been a, a sector that's sort of, uh, there's still a lot happening. Um, but we see opportunities and we think we, it's an area that we as a DFI need to show the way where we're prepared to take some risk and where we will be moving forward in the years to come. 
Um, so those are the four pillars, the sort of four sectors that we will be focusing in in this strategy period. And in terms of where will we be doing this, uh, we, we now have three offices in Africa. We've got one in Asia and one in Central America. Those are important hubs for us where we have around those offices, we have what we call core countries, uh, which are in Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and Western Africa. We'll be expanding our so-called core countries, adding on a few additional countries, like in Western Africa, we will include Nigeria, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, and Senegal as core countries. Um, we, in, in Asia, we will be looking into Indonesia, uh, also as a core country, and Sri Lanka. And in South America or Central America, we'll also include Colombia. Uh, why these countries? It's a combination of needs, but also opportunities in terms of, for instance, on the energy side, where we can find projects that we deem suitable for what we're doing. Um, we could also have included other countries, but we believe that we have to limit ourselves. We cannot be everywhere, even though we feel that we have a large capital base. It's still, in, in, in the global setting, it's still small. So we have to be focused on a few countries. That being said, we also uh, increase our capacity or our reach by investing together with partners. So we invest in funds, and, and we invest in funds in both in scalable enterprises, but also in energy and in the financial institutions. We do it partly through funds. And we expect that the, what we do through funds will increase somewhat in this period. And we also hope to work together with fund managers in terms of what we call sort of financial partnerships, uh, and in a setting where we can be more flexible in the way that we operate. We now have about 12% of what we do in funds, and in this period, that might increase to about 20%, uh, as we see it. But, um, and, 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 and there are a number of uh, professional fund managers that come up over the years that we're speaking to. So that's the core of the strategy as we view it now, and based on that, we obviously also have to uh, always take into consideration the, 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 the uh, cross-cutting issues uh, in terms of climate, in terms of gender, human rights, and anti-corruption, obviously anti-corruption being key. Um, uh, we are operating in difficult countries, challenging countries, but these are very, very important concerns that we constantly have to monitor, look into, and investigate whenever we do a new investment and also in the following up. Um, and, but still, there are risks. Um, the risks are many different levels. There's a macro risk, and, and for instance, one part of a macro risk could be that now there's lots of so-called concessional financing coming into Africa. Uh, we're trying to stem immigration from Africa by giving away free money, and some of that free money might distort certain markets, and that's a concern for us because we believe that by having a sort of the markets operating, that's when you can also attract private funding. So that's an area of concern to us. Um, but on a more, our level, the, uh, we had uh, our office, uh, went through a tough time this winter because we were based in the area that there was a terrorist action in Nairobi. And that sort of made us aware or increasingly aware of the risks that we're con constantly exposed to in terms of uh, terror. There are there's adequate ESG performance, or corruption and fraud are obvious risks that we're constantly facing. Uh, so we're doing our best to mitigate it, but, but these are risk factors. So to sum it up, I mean, I've tried to outline in very brief term and very sort of uh, aggregated level the, the areas that we'll be focusing on. And, and, and I've been asked by some people that sort of why, why stating these ambitious goals while being so concrete, because you can be criticized, but my view is that I'd much rather, three years from now, not having fully attained the goals that we set, but if at the end, at the end result being that we take us further than if we set modest goals that we met, I'm much more happy. So I'd rather get that criticism. So that, that's, that's where we're coming from. And, and, uh, but we cannot operate alone. I mean, we need partners. Uh, we need co-investors. We need service providers. We need the NGOs. Uh, and we need the support from, from various places. We just part of a big, big value chain. And many of you are here today, uh, particularly from the Norwegian community that we're working with, we really appreciate your support, your interest, and the fact that you're here today. So thank you very much.
I think everybody's awake, but just to check. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much, Telef and Olog, uh, for those inspiring addresses. We're very charged now to go out and execute on our new strategy, um, and very excited, of course, to partner with you, our new chairwoman, Olog. So welcome to Norfund. The time has almost come uh, for the mingling part of our program. That will happen at the back of the room, the lobby, and in the winter garden, is our understanding. Before that happens, though, would like to, on behalf of Norfund, very much thank all of our speakers, many of whom have come from countries very far away to speak with us. Uh, of course, those from Norway are also thanked equally. Uh, and we would like to thank you, our engaged audience. We would also uh, like to put in a plug for NABA's upcoming conference, uh, the NABA Summit, which will be here in Oslo October 8th. It's the Nordic region's leading business conference focusing exclusively on African markets. So that's sort of continuing the theme of the Norfund Conference. Thank you very much again. Am I the only one hearing the corks pop at the back? <laughs> no, we're almost there. But before we're there, we'd really like to end with voices from our markets, some stories from the field, stories about why jobs are needed and the potential that this part of the world really holds and how companies in the Norfund family is helping to create jobs and improve lives. Because after all, that's what we're here for. Thank you. Unemployment in Africa and the youth bulge needs to be addressed. The youth are a great potential. This is about the people. If they have an income, they create more of a market opportunity. Businesses grow, they create more jobs, governments get more revenue. You kick-started a, a virtual cycle. It's an emotional thing because it's about transformation of people, the socio-economic transformation of the people of Africa. And that transformation is through enabling them to really uh, provide for their families, enhance their, their livelihood. It's not just a story of the recipients of official development assistance. It isn't just a story of very fragile states with weak institutions. Africa is increasingly likely to have all the building blocks to emerge as a key growth area in the global economy over the coming decades, and it's likely to sustain that for decades. I am Mingo from Tianjin village in the Sanjiang region in Myanmar. I'm a caretaker at Yoma Micro Power Plant, and I clean the solar panels. I have a wife and two sons. In the past, I worked as a daily laborer on farms. This provided our food and accommodation, but sometimes I had a job, and sometimes I didn't. One day. I heard that Yoma Micro Power started before we did not have a good village electricity. Now we have electricity from Yoma Micro Power, and that is why our road and village are full of light. That is why I liked it, and I wanted to join them. My family life is better than in the past because I have a regular salary every month. We must save money for my youngest son's education. I can now also save some money from my salary to build a new house. I would also like to make a big donation when our house is finished as this is in our religion. These are our dreams and I'm expecting to reach our dream within the next few years. My name is Abubakar Lewano. I am a senior investment manager at Norfund. And this is my story. I grew up in a nomadic family in northern Kenya, in Marsavit, in one of the most marginalized and driest regions in the country. Livestock was our main source of livelihood. My nomadic life meant that we had to move around hundreds of kilometers with our livestock to find water and pasture. Because of this, I had to change school three times. When my village moved 
from, far from the school, I had to board at school or I had to stay with relatives. Imagine for a minute that you are at the age of eight, your f the schools have closed, and your family have moved far from school and you don't have any relatives to stay with. There I had to walk for days to look for my family. Um, in 2000, the, the harsh environment that we lived in uh, was prone to droughts and diseases that wiped out many of our livestock. But still my parents had the willingness to sell the few remaining animals to pay for my school fees. This life then changed when my uncle took me to a secondary school in the city. There I found people living settled lives. They are not moving around like we do. I saw people running sh uh, businesses, shops here, supermarkets, gas stations. And this motivated me and I said this is what I want to do. In 2009, I finished, after finishing my MBA, I saw an ad for Norfan in The Economist. I applied and I got the job. My current work has not only helped me to settle and raise a family with two children, but it has equally enabled me to support uh, three of my siblings through secondary and university education. Working as part of Norfan's investment team, I'm proud to see the enormous impact the projects that we have invested in have in the uh, developing countries. Other than the Freight in Time project that I presented a few minutes ago, uh, another case is the Lake Turkana Wind Power project, which is actually in the area that I grew up. Not only has it uh, enabled, uh, provided a potential source of electricity for my people at home, it has also provided them with job opportunities. And also, we benefited from a road which is connecting us to the urban areas. And through that, businesses have been established and jobs have been created. And for me, that is development. Thank you. It has been a long journey for me because when I joined uh, Kariki Group, I started as a value adder, a general worker. I was doing, a, I would call it casual jobs. Yeah? And then slowly by slowly, I came up, up to the year 2017, when I got a chance to uh, be one of the production managers in this firm. My full name is Geoffrey Haile Masinde. I'm in charge of production operations in the whole farm. I'm very much proud. I can't remember the guys we were working with. At the time they look at me and then they say, no, it can't work, it can't be. How did you manage to, to move to where you are? Then I normally tell them, if you take things uh, seriously into details, you will move. Because in Kariki, sky is the limit. Have a family, and I got a family after getting a job. So it's one of the benefits I got after getting a job. So I have a wife and uh, three children. I have two daughters and one son. 100% I'm supporting their life. I'm providing basic needs from the salary I'm getting from this farm. The best thing to me is growth. So in five years' time, I'm looking forward to be a farm manager because I mentioned sky is the limit and I'm coming.